my name is Carrie Thompson, and I'm with EcoAction Arlington. Uh, as we begin the meeting, um, let's acknowledge that we are holding this meeting, holding this event uh, on land that was formula, formerly occupied by the Nakachtonk Nation. And I'd also like, as we begin, to let everybody know that we are recording this event tonight. So I'd like to go ahead and introduce some um, EcoAction's co-sponsors uh, for this event and for this series. We are super pleased to be organizing this event and this series in partnership with the Faith Alliance for Climate Solutions, the Arlington Hub, and with the Sierra Club, the Potomac River Group. Now let's, let's preview the agenda uh, for the event tonight. I'm gonna move to the next slide. So in just a moment, uh, we're, I'm gonna pass the baton to Joan McIntyre, uh, the former chair of our uh, board for Eco Action Arlington, and now a volunteer. She's been a real driver behind this, uh, this program, this series. Um, and uh, she will give us an overview of the Getting to Carbon Neutrality series. And then Joan will hand it off uh, to our moderator, Joan Kelsch. Um, and Joan uh, will give us uh, some of the rules of the road uh, for the evening and for the speakers. And then she'll introduce the first speaker. Uh, and then she'll um, introduce the subsequent speakers just before they begin to speak. So after we hear from our terrific speakers uh, tonight, we'll have some time to take your questions. Uh, and after the questions, um, we'll do a little look ahead at some upcoming events and, and I will close the event. Um, so with that, um, welcome everybody again. Um, and I'm pleased to turn the floor over to Joan McIntyre. Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to our... Um, second program of our um, Getting to Carbon Neutrality series. Um, we're doing these series as a way of letting people get a better understanding of what we mean by carbon neutrality and how you actually, how we actually can get there as a community and as individuals. So we're providing a range of information. It's a complicated topic. So we're trying to break it down into chunks so that people can understand it better. Our first program looked at um, reimagining Arlington and looked at the broad view of what we mean by carbon neutrality and how can Arlington achieve its goal of getting to carbon neutrality by 2050. Um, tonight's program is going to focus on our buildings our, and our homes and what do we mean by a zero carbon or carbon neutral home. Um, and then and, and so that give you good ideas of what we mean, what it takes, and then some good tips in terms of what you can do um, to actually work on your own homes or um, improve buildings within the community. Um, and then our next pathway is we'll continue to look at buildings, but we're going to look at it from the broader set of what is the kind, what what are the um, building blocks do we need? What are, what is the kind of infrastructure um, legal requirement or legal regulatory environment, um, funding um, buildings to, to make this transition of all of our buildings to um, get into um, zero carbon buildings. So, so, and then we'll do additional programs as 2022 progresses, um, looking at other topics. Um, with that, I will turn it over to Joan Kelch, who is our moderator for tonight. Um, she is recently retired from Arlington County's Green Building Program Manager. In the 27 years that she's been working with Arlington County, she's worked on a wide range of issues, including green buildings, energy, recycling, watershed management, open spaces, and affordable housing issues. She initiated and co-led Arlington's climate initiative known as Arlington's Initiative to Rethink Energy. In her first months of retirement, Joan is helping local organizations promote climate action and outdoor learning opportunities for K to 12 students. So thank you, Joan, for, and welcome. Hi, thank you. Um, thanks, Joan, and welcome everybody. Thank you for putting up with a little technical glitch at the beginning. I hope everybody's on board and um, able to participate. Um, it is great to be here, and we're glad so many of you came to join us tonight. Uh, we have a very robust panel for you, and I'm particularly excited because I've worked with all of these folks over the years 
on a variety of different projects and they really are the best in their field. Um, it's nice to see some old friends again. Thanks for coming. Uh, two quick things before we start. Uh, very importantly, please mute yourself throughout the evening. Um, you are welcome to keep your video on or off as you like, but it's really important that we not have a lot of background noise. Um, and on Zoom, we are not able to manage real-time conversation. I'm sorry about that, but if you have questions, and we hope you do, uh, please put them in the chat, and we will get those um, get to those after the presentations are finished. So with those quick rules of engagement, I think we'll jump right in. Um, our first presenter today is Carl Elefante. Um, Carl is the Principal Emeritus with Quinn Evans, where he made a name for himself working in historic preservation and community revitalization projects. I've worked with Carl over the years, and he is well known for coining the phrase, the greenest building is the one that is already built, and he will elaborate on that this evening. Um, Carl teaches at Catholic University and at the University of Maryland and served as the president of the American Institute of Architects in 2012. Carl is unable to be here in person because he is at the COP26 climate conference in Glasgow, representing us well, I hope. Um, but he sent a recorded message of his presentation and we're gonna listen to that now. So I'm gonna have ask Joan, the other Joan, to uh, tee that up for us. Carl Elefante speaking. Thanks to Eco Action Arlington and especially to Leslie Loudon, Joan McIntyre, Joan Kelsch, and Eleanor Hodges for the invitation to be with you today. This presentation will provide an overview of building sector decarbonization. My professional focus has been building reuse, which I will address also. I'm not with you today because at the time this program airs, I will be attending COP26. Today, people around the world share deep concern, even alarm, over the looming climate crisis. Yes, crisis. More and more frequently, you hear words like crisis and emergency, even catastrophe and disaster. Climate change is urgent and arguably existential. The past two years have taught us a great deal about facing an hour of maximum danger, a crisis that is both urgent and existential. How have we done confronting COVID-19? The answer is chilling. The climate crisis demands that we work together much, much more effectively and at truly global scale. This is true even for decarbonizing the building sector. Of course, the framework for building sector decarbonization crystallized at the Paris Agreement that was signed in 2015. In the six years since Paris, observations from every corner of the globe are showing that climate change is proceeding far more rapidly than was understood at the time. Our goals must be more ambitious. Our timeline must be shorter. As with solving any problem, our first task is to identify the pertinent factors and facts. To curtail greenhouse gas emissions from the built environment, we must first understand the circumstances we are working with. Since the conclusion of World War II, modern cities have sprung up by the thousands worldwide, like these four, the largest cities in America. Their cores are comprised of dense clusters, mountains of tall buildings, often very large buildings. Arlington has its own variation on this theme. These mountains of large buildings are typically surrounded by carpets of lower scale buildings, often sprawling on for mile after mile. Here too, Arlington exhibits its own variation on the theme. Looking at greenhouse gas emissions, there is a near parity between the mountains and carpets. Each represents about 50% of building sector emissions. However, nationally, the mountains represent just 5% of the building stock, while carpets a staggering 95%. Greenhouse gas emissions, often GHGs, are the metric of climate change. This chart is taken from data published by the Global Alliance for Buildings and Construction, the Global ABC. 
It illustrates greenhouse gas emissions from every economic sector, chiefly industry, transportation, agriculture, and buildings. Five of the sectors shown are for buildings. Building sector emissions total 37% of global emissions, making it the largest of the economic sectors. The proportion varies tremendously from location to location, however. For Washington, D.C., it is nearly 75%. Can you cite the number for Arlington? Do you know the emissions footprint of your home, your office, your school, your church? Two of the segments on the global ABC chart report direct emissions. One for residential buildings, another for non-residential buildings. Direct emissions are largely from burning fossil fuels on site for space heating, water heating, and cooking. Direct emissions are the easiest to picture. Two other segments on the global ABC chart report indirect emissions for residential and non-residential buildings. Indirect emissions can be a little confusing. While the heating and cooling equipment lighting, appliances, and electronic devices that populate our homes and offices are located on-site, the electricity they use is generated off-site. Their greenhouse gas emissions occur elsewhere, therefore the term indirect emissions is used. Indirect emissions are easier to understand by looking at their source, power plants. Nearly two-thirds of electricity in the United States of America is still generated by burning fossil fuels, 30% from coal, 34% natural gas, and 1% fuel oil. Do you know what fuel mix generates power for Arlington? The last building sector segment represented on the global ABC graph is for embodied emissions. Embodied emissions come from construction and the industry that produces the thousands upon thousands of materials, products, and systems that make buildings. The big three, concrete, steel, and aluminum, are responsible for more than 22% of global energy-related GHGs, about half of that for use in buildings. The second climate question Bill Gates asks in his recent book, How to Avoid a Climate Disaster, is what is your plan for cement? Embodied emissions are a significant factor that often is overlooked in the discussion of building sector emissions. What does the building sector decarbonization roadmap look like? Let's take a look. While its roots go back to the oil embargo of 1973, and many of its concepts evolved through green building principles and practices, the strategy for building sector decarbonization was crystallized in the Architecture 2030 Challenge posed in 2005 and embraced as a doctrine at the Paris Summit a decade later. Ed Mazaria, the founder of Architecture 2030 pictured here, Incidentally, Ed is the AIA gold medalist for 2021, brought an almost incomprehensible yet true story about the American building sector to the Paris Summit. Over the decade leading up to the Paris Summit, 2005 to 15, the American building stock grew by about 10% in total, yet sector energy use remained flat and greenhouse gas emissions dropped. This hugely significant decoupling continues to this day. Since 2005, while the building sector continues to grow, nearly 20%, along with real GDP, more than 20%, building sector energy use has dropped by more than 5%, and building sector emissions have dropped a stunning 30%. This miracle of loaves and fishes shows not only that getting to zero can be done, but more importantly, that the building sector is already on its way. The formula for building sector decarbonization is as simple as ABC. 
zero out operational carbon from operating our buildings, both direct and indirect emissions. The target is 2030. Zero out embodied carbon from the construction industry and the building products industry. The target is 2040. And last but not least, meet all building sector energy needs with renewable, non-polluting energy. A great deal has evolved since the Paris Summit. This said, the building sector roadmap being forged at COP26 is also as simple as ABC. It starts with building codes. Building codes have moved forward very quickly in the six years since Paris. In fact, the 2021 codes put us on a path to zero emissions. Second is electrification and renewables. It is essential to end natural gas and all other fossil fuel use in buildings on and off site. It is essential to decarbonize the electric grid and incorporate renewables on buildings and around cities. And last but not least, is to reinvent construction and the building products industry to reach zero emissions by 2040. What can we do? We can use our buying power as the designers and occupiers of buildings. There are two transformational design paradigm shifts that we, we together, can implement from today forward. Both are technologically achievable. However, both suffer economic barriers that exist only because the fossil fuel industry has been favored with huge economic subsidies for decades. Bill Gates addresses this phenomenon as green premiums, which in my view, misses the essential reality that carbon is not fairly priced in the American economy. Both also suffer from regulatory barriers that can be changed administratively and legislatively. The first paradigm shift is making a real and full commitment to zero net energy buildings. Nearly every building in Arlington is of a scale and character capable of being a zero net energy building. This is not so much a technical challenge. It requires only pricing carbon to reflect its real costs, including trillions of dollars in climate impacts and changing codes and utility regulations. The second imperative paradigm shift is to build with carbon positive materials, materials that sequester carbon. Today, the easiest way to build carbon positive buildings is to utilize materials which sequester carbon naturally like wood and bamboo. Nearly every building project in Arlington, whether new construction or renovation, can be constructed with carbon positive materials. As an architect who spent much of my career adapting and preserving existing buildings, I cannot leave the consideration of decarbonizing buildings without sharing one other perspective, the importance of avoided emissions. Perhaps the most comprehensible way to illustrate avoided emissions is through an example. Here is a project in Detroit that has great relevance to opportunities here in Arlington. The plaza, as it's named, was a multi-story office building that had fallen onto hard times. Quinn Evans was hired to convert the plaza to housing. The scope of our project was rather typical. It began with reconditioning the exterior enclosure, the curtain wall, upgrading it to meet current performance and energy standards. Next, the interior of the building was completely reconstructed to accommodate kitchens, bathrooms, and every feature needed for housing use. The one substantial element that was retained without significant modification was the building superstructure the floor plates, columns, and beam network of the building. The carbon emissions impact of keeping the structure was enormous. The story begins by looking at the embodied emissions of the project. The embodied carbon value of the structure alone is more than double the entire interior reconstruction and curtain wall upgrade. For the full greenhouse gas emissions picture, 
we must look at both the embodied and the operational emissions. The baseline is established by the pre-renovation operational emissions. This diagram illustrates 20 years of operational emissions had no project been undertaken. Comparative actions must be measured against this no action baseline. To understand the costs and benefits of the renovation project, first, embodied emissions for the curtain wall and interior upgrades, represented with the gray blocks across the lower portion of the graphic, must be accounted for. Once the building is reoccupied, operational emissions, shown by the yellow triangle, accumulate over time. Note that the slope of the operational emissions is lower because of the renovated building meets contemporary energy codes. After eight years, there is a net reduction in emissions from the no action baseline. Now let's compare the renovation approach with a new building replacement project. Simply by accounting for the additional embodied emissions for the required structural elements, the graphic has changed dramatically. The large dark gray block shows the huge impact of the additional embodied emissions. Even with the improved operational performance of the energy code compliant new building, it now takes 20 years before net emissions reduction occurs. The replacement building has no climate benefit over the original unrenovated building over a 20 year period. You can see the dramatic difference between the renovation and replacement scenarios. The term that I use to describe the difference is avoided emissions. I believe that the greatest opportunity facing Arlington in implementing a zero carbon building sector is to monetize avoided emissions. There are hundreds of buildings in Arlington where such avoided carbon scenarios apply. And it is not only for multi-story office buildings and other large scale buildings. There are thousands of single family houses that will need to be upgraded over the next 20 years out of necessity of their age and condition. Thousands more must be upgraded to reach carbon neutrality. I hope my presentation helped you feel a sense of urgency. I hope it also gave you confidence that achieving a decarbonized building sector is within reach. In fact, we are already on the path. The barriers are less technical than cultural and economic. FDR assured the American people of his generation that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. It is not so different today. The only thing stopping us is ourselves. We can, we must commit fully working together on an urgent existential threat that can, that must be resolved by this generation of Arlingtonians and Americans, in fact, of all humanity. I look forward to sharing my experiences from COP26 sometime in the future. Thank you for participating today. Thank you very much. Um, Carl covered a lot in his presentation. I'm sorry he isn't here to take some questions from us, but he made it clear how important it is for us to be working on climate issues and on energy efficiency in buildings in particular. Um, we are making good progress and he did a good job explaining that, um, but we cannot stop yet. And I, I like the way he separated out the direct, indirect and embodied energy use, uh, particularly the impacts of embodied energy, which is the energy that is used to build the building itself, not to operate it as it continues on. And one more thing, Carl would want me uh, to repeat one more time his mantra that the greenest building is the one already built. Um, addressing embodied energy in existing buildings is a great opportunity. And with some creativity and thoughtful construction, we can make existing buildings a solution to our climate problem. So next on the agenda is Sandra Leibowitz. Welcome, Sandra. Um, Sandra is the founder, owner, and managing principal of Sustainable Design Consulting. Some of you may know it as SDC. Uh, SDC is a green building consulting firm in Richmond and the Washington, D.C. area. Sandra and I have worked together for nearly 30 years. Um, she and her team provide expert green building 
uh, services to a wide variety of sustainability projects in the region. Um, and an increasing proportion of those are in multifamily residential buildings, which is what a lot of the cranes around uh, in Arlington are, are putting up these days. Um, Sandra was honored in 2017 with a Women in Sustainability Leadership Award. And in 2011, she was among the first class of lead fellows at the US Green Building Council. So Sandra, if you would share your screen, um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Let us see if this works. Okay, so thank you for having me. Um, given what we just heard from Carl Elefante about the overall context for getting to carbon neutrality as a society, I'd now like to look at what residential choices we have and how those choices might impact our global climate. I've grouped them into three categories. Uh, I don't know if you can see cursors, but big picture decisions, special considerations, and strategies for all homes. Okay, so big picture, location and transportation. First of all, where do you wanna live? Assuming you've already decided on the overall region, do you wanna live in a more dense or a less dense neighborhood? Some neighborhoods may look more urban, but looks can be deceiving. The development at the right, which rises to five stories, is actually 3.3 miles away from the nearest metro station. Meanwhile, the lower rise development at left is only 0.2 miles away from metro. That shorter walk means those residents take public transportation most places and nearly never need to drive, thereby reducing their carbon footprint. Meanwhile, if you were to walk around your own neighborhood, what would you find? Would you have a pleasant natural setting encouraging you to spend uh, time getting exercise outdoors? Would you have plenty of shops and restaurants to go to, thereby minimizing driving to stores or ordering everything online? If you had to choose between the two, which one would be more important for your lifestyle? Grouping our homes together into multi-unit or multi-family developments offers the opportunity for shared resources that we don't need to purchase and maintain individually. Common shared amenities include children's playground equipment and bike storage, but there are so many other opportunities available, including recreational facilities, shared office space, et cetera, all of which can reduce the resources needed to support a household's activities which brings me to the choice of how big a dwelling unit. Whether renting or buying, do you find the biggest one you can afford or the smallest one that meets your most important needs? You may have noticed that a couple of the images I had on earlier slides said co-housing on them. What's that? Co-housing is a collaborative model of community development wherein homeowners intentionally share facilities, additional facilities, activities, and decision-making compared with in a typical development. Originating in Denmark, co-housing in the U.S. Take, usually takes the legal structure of a condominium or co-op and is usually 20 to 40 dwelling units arranged around a common building and grounds. These photos are of three built co-housing communities in our region, and I happen to be a founding member and past resident of the one in DC. If you're interested in joining co-housing in Northern Virginia, you're in luck because Gratitude Eco Village is currently in formation targeting the Delray neighborhood of Alexandria. Check out the meetup group link to find out more about that. And by chance, uh, the groups Co-founder Yumi An is also here uh, as an attendee in this event tonight, so she can be a resource for you as well. An entire topic unto itself, green building certification is what my company does, and for more and more multi-unit residential buildings in our region. You may see one or even multiple certifications noted for a home or development. They all have their benefits, but the main thing to know is that they provide some level of verification that the home has met certain criteria for sustainable, efficient, and healthy building design and construction. If you're in a position to choose a home that has a green building certification, I certainly recommend it. If you're thinking of going solar, you need to see if your home is a good candidate. 
Is there enough unshaded roof or site area? A sun number currently tied to Zillow listings can give you a rough idea of a home's solar potential. Are there other restrictions on where the solar panels can be placed? The photo at top is my former home in Richmond. Even though it's in an old and historic district, none of the many solar panels are seen from the street, so it meets all the historic requirements. Arlington County has plenty of sun and can become a burgeoning solar community if enough of us want, us, want it to be. Currently rated as a Soul Smart Solar Community bronze level, let's see if we can help bring that up to silver or even gold soon. Finally, what are the extras you might want and more importantly, actually use? Do you want your home to have a shared vehicle or electric car charging station on site? For swimming pools, do they use the heat of the sun to preheat the water? Do you want access to a community garden plot? These are all the extras that can add up to make a difference in our residential carbon footprint. And now onto strategies for all homes. A common characteristic among green building certification programs is quality. But you don't always need a certification program to get that. Is the house built better than the current codes? Are the roof and siding made of durable materials that will last longer than 20 years? Are the foundation, walls, and roof well insulated to prevent energy loss and moisture, program, moisture problems down the road? Are the interior finishes durable while also meeting your personal taste? Or do you want to come in and rip everything out and start over? Whatever home you live in, you can hire a professional to perform an energy audit. You can also perform a DIY audit if you like, but I remember I recommend hiring a professional. A home energy rater, for example, can provide an analysis of how much energy your home currently uses and then recommend the best opportunities for improvement. This is done by a combination of visual inspection, thermal imaging, and air leakage testing to identify trouble spots. What you do with this information is then up to you to decide, but these professionals can often make referrals to help you with that as well. If you need or want to change anything in your home, think about the energy use implications. The US EPA's Energy Star website has long been a tremendous resource for identifying energy efficient products and systems that also meet certain manufacturing quality standards. From thermostats to laundry equipment, windows to light bulbs, Energy Start Gov should really be the first place you look. The second place you look should really be epa.gov slash watersense. A newer program, Watersense is also a tremendous resource, not just for labeled water efficient products, but also for plumbing, landscape, and other design strategies that can conserve this increasingly precious resource. As a double benefit, more efficient appliances such as dishwashers and clothes washers use both less water and less energy because they don't have to heat as much water to do their job. Uh, now that I've barely scratched the surface of things you can do on your own home, and since we'll do questions later, I'll, I'd like to turn it over uh, for Scott Donaldson's presentation, and I believe Joan will introduce him. He will then give you many more specific strategies for home energy efficiency success. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Um, I really appreciate all the really helpful advice you provided for homeowners. Um, I really appreciated the comments Sandra made about um, uh, thinking about the building in the context of its neighborhood, um, particularly with respect to transportation, because transportation uses a lot of energy as well. Um, I also think um, the, the um, uh, well, sharing, sharing resources she mentioned in terms of co-housing is also really important. Um, the idea of quality is really interesting to me as well, because we now think about building buildings in the 50 to 70 year time frame. We think they'll last a couple generations and then we'll tear them down and start again. Um, why can't we build buildings that last a few hundred years? They do it in Europe and elsewhere around the world. 
um, and we should start thinking about building buildings with um, longer lifespans. So thank you again, Sandra. Um, I would now like to introduce Scott Donaldson. Um, Scott is the president of Home Energy Medics, which I think makes him a building doctor. Um, home Energy Medics is a home performance company headquartered in Arlington. And Scott is a professional energy auditor and holds multiple certifications from the Building Performance Institute. He consults with homeowners to help them make wise energy efficiency choices for their homes during remodeling and new construction. Scott has collaborated with Arlington County on a variety of home focus programs over the years. And Home Energy Medics is a participant in the Northern Virginia Home Performance with Energy Star program. And Sandra, if you would stop sharing your screen, um, then we can get Scott to share his. Well, uh, thanks folks for, uh, for attending. Uh, you know, my, my role here is really to give you kind of turn this practically into some uh, knowledge and tips for improving the efficiency in, uh, in residences, whether you're in an apartment or a condo or a, a single family home. So, and uh, my first slide is really talking about what, what people are concerned about and what the benefits are of an efficient home. So it, it's, uh, people don't really think of it this way uh, too often, but it's really comfort. Uh, those improvements, you have no more uh, even temperatures, uneven temperatures between floors or cold and hot spots. Often when uh, we're improving air sealing, insulation, et cetera, that uh, reduces consumption, it, it eliminates all that. So, and uh, that's generally the number one reason why people call. But uh, what is, a, is really a, a driver for this too is consumption reduction is we anecdotally all the time, we get people telling us they can, uh, they cut the, their bills have reduced, uh, it been cut in half actually. So, and then um, certainly uh, last but not least is uh, improvements in indoor air quality. Uh, another benefit, good indoor air quality. Uh, we've got, you know, when you, when you get the kitchen ventilation right, you have no more uh, smells in the house of, uh, you know, bacon cooking in the oven or whatever you burned on the stove. You get the bathroom ventilation right, no more bathroom mildew. Uh, you, uh, you ensure your combustion appliances are venting right and the humidity gets controlled. So no more humidity in the summer, no more uh, high humidity in the summer or low humidity in the winter where it's real dry. So bottom line is uh, all these improvements can help really improve your comfort and health and stop wasting energy in the house. So, okay. So next slide is what, what is typical energy use in a home? Buildings represent the majority of energy consumed in the house. And what I really want, or consumed in the US, excuse me. And what I really want to point out is almost half of the consumption is devoted to heating and cooling. And of that, 40% is due to air leaks through ducts, through the structure, et cetera. So the bottom line is these air leaks are really causing the majority of the problem and causing uncomfortable homes and, and wasting that energy. So, okay. And what are the, the top four comfort and efficiency issues that we typically see? So, and those are, um, well, let me, most homes, it's really uh, air leakage as I, as I alluded to. So, most homes we see in the Arlington area leak two to five times the amount of air they should for healthy air exchange. So when people say, oh, I don't want to get my hair house too tight because it needs to breathe, uh, generally that's not the case because uh, they're leaking way more than they, they need to. And uh, the, the problem is you just can't see it. You can't see it. So, um, and you know, if you had a water leak and showing spots in the ceiling, you're not going to let that continue. So. So, but uh, what we're seeing this manifest itself in uncomfortable homes and, and high bills. So, um, okay, the next, here's an example of kind of some of those things, recessed lights, uh, the tops of walls around attic hatches and drop down stairs, plumbing penetrations uh, and wall top plates and uh, holes around furnace flues. So, okay. Number two is the uh, comfort and efficiency is, uh, is uh, insulation. Most homes require, are only 50% required our value that they have, but people need to understand insulation is not, a, is not 
end all to beat all, it's it's really only 50% of it only is 50% as effective as insulation air sealing combined. So that's a that's a big deal because it's a filter, not an air barrier. So okay, and here's some of the things. If you go up in your attic and you're seeing you're seeing uh, joists like this, then you immediately have a problem. And in an infrared image, it kind of manifests itself in the summertime, like you're living under pizza stone, so uh, which isn't good. Okay, number three is it uh, duct leakage. Uh, we see a lot of leakage, and where and what the how this manifests itself is a uh, second floor doesn't get enough flow, and uh, and that's where uh, you get hot and and cold. And then uh, the system runs more and uses more energy. So, and that can be fixed. And then fourth is really a uh, uh, bathroom and, and high humidity issues. So it's really, uh, if you got a foggy mirror, that's uh, when you get out of the shower and the fans on, that's usually an uh, indication it's undersized and properly ducted. And uh, again, uh, mold, mildew, high humidity are all, uh, all culprits of that. You can see this one's vented right into the insulation. Okay, and um, really the best way to, to start this, Sandra alluded to, is really start with an energy audit. It, it's really like a uh, home inspection on steroids, but it's using some specialty tools to evaluate the things that I talked about already. So no two homes are the same. And uh, you really, it's a house is a system approach. It's looking at everything and all the interactions. So, and what the what the intent is is really find the the root cause and uh, and develop solutions to address those things like uh, comfort issues, high bills, and indoor air quality issues specific to your home, and then have that prioritized list to to follow that you can go forth and with for fixes later. Okay, um, some some things for uh, on a DIY DIY approach is really oops is really um, you can seal visible caulks or visible gaps with uh, caulk, install uh, outlet gaskets, childproof caps, uh, install weather strip, foam board uh, on that show, and so you don't get that image like I showed earlier, air shooting all around the the hatch. Um, Mastic uh, can be used as kind of peanut butter consistency to seal leaks around duct seams where you can get to and around the edges of registers. Uh, install programmable thermostat is a really a great way to save. And then um, make sure we see this uh, more often than you think is fireplace dampers were, were left open and they're open almost year round. So make sure your, your fireplace damper is closed if you've got a wood burning fireplace. And then, uh, and then Make sure your uh, slot around your furnace filter is sealed. If you don't, if it's uh, not a cover on it, put some tape along the side of it, and uh, and that's good enough, just so the air doesn't get sucked in around the filter and clog up your unit. Okay, and then uh, subsequently, um, just make sure that um, your uh, your dryer duct is uh, is really uh, ducted properly, and the damper isn't stuck open. We see we see this quite often too. When they're installed uh, later, people just leave a big coil of uh, ductwork behind there, and you end up with longer dry dryer times. And then, if you've got a, a lot of new refrigerators don't have this, but if you've got an old one in the basement, make sure those coils are cleaned. Uh, this is like a big dirt blanket over the the point that's trying to cool your uh, cool your coils. So it's uh, it's not good, obviously, for uh, for efficiency. So. Okay, and then uh, kind of improvement priorities just in general. Um, the idea is kind of reduce your consumption before you produce um, in terms of solar. But the idea is uh, air seal in the structure. That's, uh, that's huge. Uh, insulation, insulate to, uh, to current standards, which are 49, that's uh, 16 inches of uh, a cellulose insulation, more if it's fiberglass. So uh, seal your ducts. Uh, they can be done by hand, as I mentioned, with mastic or uh, internal process called AeroSeal that's computer controlled and goes everywhere where you can't see in between walls and so forth. So uh, upgrade your uh, heating cooling system. Transition to uh, 18 plus SEER heat pump. Uh, if uh, you know, you've got gas, that's part of the electrification that we can do. The systems are so much better these days. And if that's not practical, uh, 
go to uh, a 95% efficient uh, gas unit. And then uh, water heater upgrades. Again, uh, they have new heat pump electric water heaters that are twice as efficient as standard electric. And then uh, if that's not practical, again, uh, a tankless or a high efficiency tank system. Uh, window replacements are, um, are, uh, are good, but they're certainly way down on the list. People always think that that's first thing they have to do. So, uh, and then appliance upgrades, we pretty much all know. And then, uh, and then solar panels are, uh, are last, but don't worry if you put in solar panels first, you can still go back and do these other things and it makes the solar panels a uh, ton more efficient in uh, covering a larger percentage of your energy use. And then uh, other benefits or incentives for some of these improvements, it's really increased home value. Uh, studies have shown uh, in Virginia and in our area that uh, people are willing to pay 5% more for uh, a sale price, 4% more for a house that they know is uh, comfortable and efficient, healthy and safe. And then um, these can actually be uh, certified for higher resale value. Pearl says they make homes, they make home value visible. So um, these, uh, so these improvements really add value to the house. So, and they're there to, to help prove that. So with the documentation and so forth. So, and uh, you can see more about that at pearl.org, pearlcertification.org. Uh, federal tax credits uh, are expiring this year, as we know, uh, currently, but they're uh, up to $500 insulation air sealing and uh, HVAC upgrades. And there are Dominion rebates uh, for air sealing insulation, HVAC improvements. It's uh, 1K plus. It's really uh, mainly geared towards all electric homes, but there are some other incentives that uh, of a smaller dollar amount that are uh, are available as well for for non 100% uh, electric houses. So, okay. And then in conclusion, uh, air leaks are the number one cause of hot and cold spots, followed by low insulation, duct leakage, and uh, bath ventilation. Most houses leak uh, two to five times again as much air as they need to for healthy standards. Uh, and the recommendation is start with the energy audit, get a good understanding of the source of the problems, get that prioritized roadmap so you figure out what you need to do to, uh, to really help improve all those things, comfort, uh, efficiency, and then health and safety of your house. And then just making some basic insulation air sealing improvements can save 20% more on energy use. And again, you do not have to replace your windows to save a ton of money. So, and, uh, and that's all, thank you so much. I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity. Thank you, Scott. Uh, very practical advice and information, I appreciate that. Um, I particularly appreciate the emphasis on comfort and health and moisture management in homes, because those are um, speak perhaps more to people's needs than, the, than talking about energy efficiency all the time. Everybody wants to live in a comfortable and healthy home. Um, I also appreciate your pictures of the air leaks. Um, you can't see air leaks with the naked eye, but if you use an infrared camera, it actually, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words and that, that's really helpful. Um, Sandra had some photos of that as well. And I think that camera technology is readily available. And in fact, uh, shameless plug for the air program in Arlington Public Libraries, you can take out, you can borrow an infrared camera from the library and take it home and play with it a little bit and see um, you can see the color difference around your windows and in your walls and um, look at the corners and the baseboards and see if you can't get a sense of how much uh, your house might be leaking and might need some repairs. So thank you very much, Scott. Appreciate it. If you would stop sharing your screen, we will move on to Helen, who's our last panelist. Um, Helen has been an urban, Helen Reinecke Wilt, I'm sorry, Helen Reinecke Wilt is an um, urban and environmental planner in the DC area for over 30 years. Before joining Arlington County, Helen worked for, on smart growth planning and urban environmental initiatives in Falls Church and in Maryland. Helen and I worked together in the county's Rethink Energy office uh, beginning in 2008. And she manages the county's Green Home Choice Program, which certifies single family homes, um, residential homes, um, uh, to be very energy efficient. Helen also oversees some other uh, sustainability initiatives in the county, including the solar co-op program and electric vehicle planning. 
She's a member of the American Institute of Certified Planners and is a lead accredited professional. Helen, the screen is yours. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having me this evening. Um, it's Joan said, I'm a member of the Arlington Initiative to Rethink Energy. And I work on, I wear a number of hats, as she said, and tonight I'll be focusing primarily on the Green Home Choice Program. But I will touch a little bit on the solar co-op and electric vehicle or vehicle uh, decarbonization planning. So um, Arlington has a really big, Whoops, something happened. <laughs> Sorry, Arlington has really big climate goals. Um, in 2019, the county updated its community energy plan. As Joan um, McIntyre was saying, our biggest overarching goal is to become carbon neutral by 2050. To do this, we'll have to make buildings and transportation much more efficient. And then um, also we'll have to add um, a significant number of renewables. So where are the greenhouse gas emissions coming from in Arlington? These numbers are from 2016, but in 2016, 23% were coming from residential buildings and about 36% were was coming from transportation. Recent COG estimates show the residential numbers at closer to 30% for 2020. This isn't surprising because so many people are working from homes. So and now you can imagine a lot of our energy use is coming from homes and less from um, commercial office buildings. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Greenhome Choice program. Greenhome Choice is a free program like Lead for Homes. It focuses on reducing energy, water, and waste, creating better indoor air quality and comfort, and improving durability and resiliency in new homes, renovations, and additions. Greenhome Choice even certifies small kitchen and bath projects. So basically, we, we take a lot of what Scott and also Sandra were saying and apply it um, to a home certification program. So here's a little information about what Greenhome Choice has accomplished in its history. Um, close to 400 homes have been certified to date um, and many more uh, homeowners, builders, and uh, designers and architects have gotten a lot of coaching from the program, um, lot, many more than the 400. We also have over 60 participating builders. Staff has collected energy usage data to show that green home choice new homes are performing about 42% better than similar sized homes in Arlington, and green home choice renovations are using about 55% less energy per square foot after renovation than they were before. We'll look at a little case study in a minute. So participants are making their homes a little bit bigger usually, and yet their energy bills are lower. Sometimes they are even doubling the size of their homes and their energy bills are lower. For example, the average green home choice adds about a thousand square feet and their energy bills are typically 26% lower than they were uh, before. In addition, 10% of green home choice certified homes have also added solar. This makes them extremely low energy use homes and 16 have added geothermal heating and cooling systems. A lot of the people that have added solar have also participated in our solar, solar co-op. So we get a really kind of double um, whammy for our program. So what makes Green Home Choice homes energy efficient? First and foremost, as Scott was mentioning, a great building envelope. That means we're sealing up all the holes in the building we're using really good insulation applied well in the walls, basements, and attics. Um, Green Home Choice new homes re also require a home energy rating, which includes third-party testing, um, duct uh, blaster testing, and blower door testing to show how tight the envelope is and how tight the ducts are. Um, and renovation projects are also highly encouraged to have this third-party testing done. Efficient and right size heating and cooling equipment is extremely important um, in the Green Home Choice Program. Um, Scott may have mentioned that uh, having your system sized appropriately not only improves comfort, but also really improves efficiency. So most of our homes have oversized heating and cooling systems. This is something when you go to change out a system, make sure that you have the system modeled, um, what they call a manual J can be done 
to make sure that it's the right size. Efficient lighting and appliances is pretty easy. We can just look for that Energy Star label. Passive solar design is also a basic um, design uh, feature where we, we, we really consider where we put glass. First of all, we want to minimize glass in buildings as much as possible. What we look at where we put it so that we can um, gain energy in the winter from that glass and deflect it during the summer through shading. Also, on-site renewable energy sources, um, solar and geothermal, are a part of the Green Home Choice program. So let's look at a little case study. Um, this is your tip was your typical Arlington two-story colon brick colonial. Um, many of you live in those homes. Um, this is a before and after. So this was a gut renovation and addition project. So after gutting the entire inside of the home. Um, the owner and project team chose to use spray foam and the entire building envelope, the walls and the ceilings. Um, spray foam is a great interior insulator. Other people are also using sealed exterior sheathing products um, that keep the air out from the outside of the house in a continuous way. And also a lot of people are using exterior insulation, which is actually another continuous insulation approach, whereas here, if you had that thermal camera, you would see color showing where all the studs are present. Um, but if you do it on the exterior of the house, it's continuous. But interior uh, spray foam is an air barrier and also a good insulator. Um, let's see. And this project chose to use geothermal heat pump um, as their heating and cooling source. And they also chose to use an energy recovery ventilation system. Geothermal heat pumps can bring down heating and cooling and energy use by about 40 to 50%. I saw some people in the chat talking about geothermal systems. So I'd love to hear about their comments about it. Um, today, solar energy could be more uh, cost effective at this point than geothermal, um, but some projects would choose to use both geothermal and solar to try to really get down to net zero energy use. This project also chose to use an energy recovery ventilation system to bring in fresh air. Um, and what that does is it um, it get it uh, captures the energy that you would normally lose by bringing air inside and outside of the house for ventilation. Okay, now let's look a little bit at um, the uh, actual stats for this project. Um, so the average total energy use per square foot per per year was fifty four. We also refer to this as the energy use intensity of the building. Um, that's pretty high. The average when this project was built for Arlington for all single family homes was 45. So the pre-renovation was 54, the post-renovation was 17, and um, the percentage change was uh, so 69%. Even though the house more than doubled in size, the total energy cost dropped by 19%, and the energy use per square foot dropped by almost 70%. That's pretty impressive. So this is just a nice interior shot of the house. This house did have a fair amount of glass on the south side of the house, which is like we said, bringing a nice heat into the house in the winter. And the exterior, you can't see there's a nice, um, there's a nice awning on the exterior to, to shade the house in the, in the hot summer months. So I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about our solar um, and electric vehicle charging cooperatives. Um, we are uh, almost finished our seventh cooperative, um, and we have installed um, and or had contracts for over 380 solar systems, 40, more than 45 electric vehicle chargers, and more than 10 battery systems. Um, we are should have final numbers for this year's co-op uh, in a couple of weeks, but this year's co-op has um, seen almost doubling of well, it has more than doubled some of the years, um, what, we've, what we've achieved in some of the years, but it's almost double what we've achieved in the highest year. We were up to this week to 99 solar contracts, and we've already installed 47 of those. So we're just waiting for some final contracts to be signed. Um, that's really exciting, and um, so we'll hope to have some final numbers um, soon on that. And finally, um, to reduce our carbon impact, we really have to begin to replace gas engine vehicles with electric or other fuel source vehicles. 
The carbon emission impacts in Virginia, according to the Union of Concerned Scientists, is about 60% less from an EV today than from a gas engine. So if you have an EV already, that's wonderful. If you're thinking about replacing a car, I strongly can, um, encourage you to consider an electric vehicle. Um, you can buy an EV charger through our co-op. Um, and there are several rebates um, around from, from Dominion and from the federal government for EV chargers. Um, the county's working on, and, and actually that 60% will improve as the grid gets cleaner, and that's happening each year as we transfer more and more of our grid to renewable resources and cleaner resources. The county's working on EV planning, both for the fleet conversion and community-wide conversion. Um, we'll be kicking off a transportation decarbonization plan in early 2022. This is really exciting, and we hope that you all be, will be involved in that effort. Um, so that concludes my presentation. Um, to learn more about participating in green home choice or energy efficiency, solar cooperatives or electric vehicles, please see these websites. Um, I'll make sure that um, the, the hosts have the most recent version of this. Um, and also you can contact me at the following um, email address. Thank you. Great, thank you, Helen. Um, Green Home Choice really is a great little program offered in Arlington County. And um, the electric vehicle solar co-op um, program is also great and available to all Arlington residents if you are interested. So um, our four uh, presenters did a really good job of reiterating the impacts of homes um, on energy use. 60% uh, of the energy used in Arlington is used um, in single family and multifamily homes. So there's a lot of opportunity to reduce our, our carbon footprint um, in the places that we live. Um, there are some very simple things you can do and there are some more complex things you can do um, to, to um, reduce your footprint. And there are programs and resources available um, to, to get you, to help you do that work. So lot, you're not out there by yourself trying to figure this out. Um, air sealing and insulation are impactful and affordable. Um, easily done, lots of contractors that do that and lots of folks that can help you figure that out. Um, just in conclusion, I would like to add that Arlington is a comparatively small community, all 25 square miles of it. But if we think globally and act locally, um, we can make huge progress towards reducing our global greenhouse gas um, emissions and reaching those goals that COP26 is trying to establish today. So. Don't underestimate the power of, of the little people in all of this. Um, and hopefully the information you got today will help you help you um, get there. So I'm gonna hand it to Carrie Thompson, who is gonna has been monitoring the chat and will ask mm -hmm. some of the questions that you all have posed. And we'll try to get the speakers to um, respond. And we will end promptly at 8.30, I promise. We've got about 20 minutes of questions. Mm -hmm. Carrie. Thank you. Thanks so much, Joan. Um, so we've had a very active chat and, you know, one of the things that was interesting is people asked questions and, and some of the participants helped to answer and that that's terrific. Um, there was a question specifically for Scott, which I think is probably on a lot of people's minds. Where's the best place to start? Do you replace the water heater with heat pumps, then the heat pump to replace gas furnace, then solar PV to power the home? It costs too much to do it all at once. And so is there a recommendation, a standard recommendation to everyone about where to start? Scott, see if you can keep it real succinct. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I think that, and and just, uh, just a couple words, it's really the envelope and it's uh, air sealing and insulation. That's the biggest bang for the buck uh, right off the get-go. And that'll help you get, uh, as Helen said, it, you can reduce the uh, heating and cooling load on the house and that will help uh, get your system size right. You've got to replace them. You can often get a smaller system and uh, it will cost less to begin with and cost less to run every single day, so. Terrific, uh, that was uh, a very uh, uh, to the point um, answer, Scott, thanks so much. Um, now, of course it costs money to, to make these renovations. Uh, one participant said that Previously, they took out a loan uh, to go from gas to electric, and over time, the savings um, over a couple of years uh, was able to amortize the, the loan. Um, but for those who can't afford it, um, can Arlington or does Arlington provide funding to residents to make the switch? 
Maybe that's Helen. Um, I would say that we have uh, money to, to give to people for the switch. Um, I think they're going to have to rely at this point on the federal tax rebate and any other utility rebates that may be um, in action at the moment. Um, Scott may be able to tell you about something else too. Um, I think, but, um, but anyway, for the moment, that's what we have. And it, it's some possibility that we'll get some funding from the state um, coming out of the federal initiatives that are being proposed at the moment. So we're hopeful about that. Great, thanks very much, Helen. If I may add just one, one comment to that is, yeah, the, uh, even if you take out a loan, the, the cost of that loan, the, the uh, servicing the loan is really made up by the energy savings that, uh, that you see. So in, in essence, you, uh, you can get almost a free loan. Uh, you just got to be able to get it. So, cause it's really not going to cost you anything in the end game. So. What is the time period usually, uh, Scott, for people to, to pay off the loan with the savings? Uh, well, you can pay off the entire improvement, okay, with savings and typically uh, about 15 years. So, but uh, the really it varies the interest rate. You're going to make up for that on a monthly basis with just a reduction in consumption. Like I said, a lot of homes you can knock 50% out of the the consumption doing this right. Great, thank you. Um, so there was a lot of chat about geothermal. Uh, and there was one specific question asking if there are examples of geothermal heating and cooling systems in Arlington. Uh, this person was interested in including it in their renovation. Not sure who is best place to uh, answer that. Helen, I can answer that. So no. for Jim, Ken, um, I mentioned there were about 16 um, geothermal systems within the Arlington Green Home Choice Program. So I've been involved in, with a number of those projects. And there are others other than those people. Um, and I see Paul Snodgrass uh, typing in here. He's, he's a recent geothermal heat pump um, installed, installer person, <laughs> resident who's installed it. That's what I'm trying to say. I would add that both Tacoma Village co-housing and Eastern Village co-housing um, DC and Silver Spring respectively had geothermal systems. And when I lived in Tacoma Village, my average electric bill was 20 bucks. Impressive. Okay, well, um, maybe we can um, talk for a minute about um, retrofitting and, and renovations. Um, there were two questions and, and um, Sandra, you touched on this, um, and also Carl in his statement, uh, and Joan has reiterated that the greenest building is the one that uh, remains standing. Um, one question was, is there a way to shame developers? I don't know if shame really works, but into tearing down existing homes to create the much larger ones we all see around Arlington. And um, a second question related to that, Arlington classifies as renovation, um, uh, even if a, only a very small remnant of the old house remains. So is Arlington really committed to actual re retrofitting? And um, how can data be compiled when uh, a renovation is actually a new building? Um, so uh, maybe that those are kind of complex questions, but it's a, I suppose it's a policy question about Arlington. Um, are, are we trying to keep buildings standing? Um, I'll, I'll try to answer that. Um, it's tricky. Um, I think in uh, a, a number of years ago, the county was making people try to keep up, you know, a certain number of walls of the house before they classified it as um, a new home. And I think now a lot of the houses are being allowed to just keep basically the foundation which is still a plus in terms of um, embodied carbon. You still have all that concrete in the foundation that's being saved, so that's good. But it is tricky in how it's classified. I don't, um, Arlington doesn't have control over, in most cases, of whether a house is um, torn down or not. I think in a very few cases, um, is there any control over that? Um, so it's it, whatever happening is because of the way the market is um, is set up. And, um, anyway, in terms of green home choice, it's even hard 
for me sometimes to decide which way I'm going to classify a project, whether it's going to be new construction or renovation. Um, and it, I usually just have to look at it on a case by case basis. Thanks. Did uh, anyone else want to um, weigh in on that uh, topic? If not, I, I have um, another question. Actually, that again, there were two that were somewhat similar um, related to what can or cannot uh, or can't Arlington do in terms of requiring either developers or uh, uh, owners, uh, landowners, uh, in terms of their building choices and their energy choices. Uh, the first question is, is it feasible for Arlington or any municipality to require the use of solar panels on new construction? Um, and then is Arlington considering a ban on new fossil fuel uh, or gas in new commercial and residential buildings? If not, why not? I can answer a little bit of that is, um, is really Arlington's uh, county, even if they want to do the hands are tied by what uh, the state, the state building codes are in uh, Leslie or somebody, I, I can't remember the um, Dillon rule, I think it's called. So correct me if I'm wrong there, but uh, it, it, they have to conform to what the, uh, what the state puts out. So they're, they cannot go to uh, a stricter standard right now, even if they wanted to. So that's really the, the, the problem that we're uh, that we're in right now. That being said, Arlington's green building program with which Joan ran for so long um, has been a showpiece for the entire country of how to successfully incentivize more sustainable technologies and overall energy efficient construction. So um, that's the way that's the way to do it in Virginia. Um, okay, Thanks. I have a question, very practical one, uh, perhaps for Scott and then maybe for Helen also. Um, how long does it take to do an energy upgrade? Um, do you have to move out of the house to do it? Is it a day, a week, um, complicated? Give us a sense of what it's like to have that work done on your home. Yeah, I can, I can answer that. We do uh, retrofits every single day and and typical projects are a week long to two weeks long if we have to do uh, drywall work, surgical drywall work to get where we need to go and repair it. Uh, homeowners rarely ever move out of the house. So that's, it's gotta be a, a pretty big effort if they're, they're moving out. So the answer is most people stay there that they're working during the day when we are. So yeah, there's really <laughs> minimal impact. Good, thank you very much. Um, Carrie, do you have another one from the chat? Sure. Um, the, the questions are coming fast and furious, so I'm, I'm trying to toggle between. Um, but, um, you know, we all know we've had a lot of discussion about uh, uh, different types of housing in Arlington, missing middle, etc. cetera. Um, um, a question about um, multifamily uh, living and, you know, is there a way we could make it more appealing? What um, new considerations are there for sound attenuation in a multifamily dwelling? Uh, maybe this is for Sandra. I'm not sure um, who feels best place to answer it. Sure. I mean, how you design the wall system um, is, you know, pretty much a universal um, issue. Doesn't have to be a green building necessarily, um, but do you have that extra layer of drywall? Do you have the uh, resilient channel that kind of stops the sound vibration from going through all the materials? Um, so those are those are design tricks, and I don't know that they cost a whole lot more in the grand scheme of things. So those are that's just that falls into the bucket of quality construction. You know, you can do a lot of things where you cut corners and it's good enough for code, but what can you do that's better? Yeah, and just to echo Sandra's comments, uh, we do a lot of uh, soundproofing retrofit work and uh, it is very expensive to do as a retrofit scenario, but uh, is definitely the, the way to go is an in initial construction. So, but there's no uh, soundproofing code per se that, that I know of, it just gets into, uh, the, the quality construction that she mentioned. Okay, good. Um, we talked a bit um, about electric cars. Um, whoops, the question just uh, moved. Um, but 
I think the question, okay, here it is. If the house does not have a garage, what are the considerations for charging an electric vehicle? Can it be done? Okay, I'll take this. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Helen. Um, you, I think the, you, you don't have to have a garage for in the first place. Definitely don't need to have a garage. Um, you, you do really need to have a driveway to be able to charge at home. Um, the county has not yet considered allowing people to put chargers in in the public right of way, which is uh, the grass strip in front of your house belongs to the county. Uh, perhaps that may happen as time moves on, but that, that's not permitted right now. So, but if you have a driveway, you can easily put a charger, they can sit on the outside of your house, put a ball alert in your driveway, or you can hang it right on the house, as a lot of my clients have. Um, and all you need is a, uh, to put in a level two charge or all you need is a separate um, 240 volt circuit. Um, you can charge though off of a regular 110 um, outlet um, on the outside of your home. So if you have that, you're in pretty good shape. Um, the other options are there's, there will, and there are already over a hundred chargers in Arlington that are open to the public. Um, and there will be many more in the coming years. Thank you, Helen. Um, I think there are some rebates for EVs these days still um, at the federal level. Is that is that right? There's still a cl close to seventy five hundred dollar rebate on a on a variety of models. Some of those expired, but there's still um, a number of them available. And there's also a, a national network of charging stations. So if you're um, traveling about, you can um, tap in. There's an app on your phone or some of the cars actually have it in their system. It'll take you to the, the right charging station so that you can, you don't have to worry about running out of juice. Right, right. So that is already in existence, um, but I know the current um, administration is um, determined to, have to strengthen that interstate charging system um, pretty dramatically as well. And the private sector is doing it too. They're, they're, they're on a mission. A lot of the big private EV charging vendors are trying to connect um, interstate highways. Okay, here's another question. I, um, it's possible it's uh, for Helen again. I, I'm sorry if we're barraging you with the questions, but what does it actually mean to be a green home choice? Uh, home. Uh, is it just a pride thing or does it mean something more? <laughs> well, um, I guess for some people it is a pride thing. Um, I, I mean, the, the benefits are that you get a lot of free consulting, mainly for me, um, who's been doing this for quite a long time. Um, you, we do think that it increases your home value slightly. There are national studies showing that. Um, in some cases, you can even get a larger mortgage um, because you can show that your ener monthly energy costs are going to be lower, which gives you a bigger um, budget for the mortgage. It's called a green mortgage. Um, and I think your house yeah, will eventually be worth more. And when you go to re resell it, you'll, you'll recoup some of the, um, the benefits from that. Um, I'd like I'd to just jump in. Helen's being very modest. Um, green Home Choice is a um, multi-page list of of criteria and standards that the house has to meet. It's voluntary, so there's no hammer if you don't do it, but Helen coaches the homeowner and the developer through the process to make sure that all of these things that go into a green home are actually there. So the, the right equipment, good air sealing, um, solar panels if you want, whatever, windows, materials, all that sort of stuff. So it's a, it's a very real um, and real program and, and niche to Arlington, so it's very specific to Arlington. And if I may just jump onto that too, it's, it's really guarantees you're going to get a comfortable, efficient, and uh, healthy and safe house. So that's really the, the biggest benefit too in the bigger scheme of things. So you've got the yeah. backing of Helen and company to, to make sure you get there. Thanks, Scott. And durability and resiliency are huge. Like with the biggest um, thing that can happen to your house is water damage, um, bulk water damage outside. So I, I do pay a lot of attention to that and help people make the right choices um, so that they don't have those kind of problems later on. 
And, and one of the other benefits is uh, lower utility bills. So there's ongoing operational cost savings as well. There's I another question. question for Sandra. Oh, please go. Oh. No, please go, Joan. Just a quick one. Um, in your in your experience with multifamily housing, what is the what are people doing on electric vehicle charging in the in the garages of apartments and condos? Sandra might have some ideas too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The new green building density incentive program. Sandra might be able to add on to this, and Joan, you too. Um, uh, incentivizes, uh, I think it's 3% of spaces. I actually, I'm gonna let Andrew say, because I'm not afraid I'm gonna get the number yeah. wrong. Just, I was wondering from a, just from a general from view point. Jim, why don't you tell, okay. answer your question. Sandra, For let's new, get yeah, I'm, here, I'm having some audio issues. I'm not quite hearing the questions, but just in general, um, I think we're going to see it more and more. I don't know the specifics. I mean, even though my company works on 200 projects at a time, I don't know this. <laughs> I only know so much about each one of them. So uh, I, I could easily find out how many of them currently have electric chargers in their you know, garage designs or that have been built that way. I know one of the office buildings I worked on in Arlington a million years ago now was the one and two Potomac Yard for the EPA. And they had electric chargers before electric cars had a comeback, you know? So at first it was like, oh, they were just sort of buying it for a lead point. <laughs> and then it, you know, as time went on, it was like, that's great that they have that, you know? Yeah. So in, for new construction in Arlington, the Green Building and Density Incentive Program, if the applicants are going through that, I believe it's 3% of um, the spaces have to have chargers and 6% have to be wired for them. So we've been seeing them in all the new projects. We're getting calls from lots and lots of existing multifamily uh, property managers who want to install and it, it, the thing is, it costs six times more to do it uh, after the fact than it does in the initial. And it's it's very complicated. So we're, we're trying to work through a lot of that and help people. Um, but it, it's sort of the, we still have to figure it out. And I think some new technologies are going to make it easier over time. But the way, way we things are right now, it's, it's pretty difficult to retrofit buildings. And that's why what's become popular um, for green building programs is EV ready infrastructure. So you make sure that the electric service is all there. You don't, you know, this is in the context of lead and other things, you don't necessarily have to install the charger right then and there, but it's just like a house being solar ready. So you just plop it in later when it comes time. There is some other thing there is some new software out in the world that's allowing i've seen it being used in a few places that's allowing load shifting and load sharing on with multifamily buildings and office buildings such that um, they don't necessarily have to beef up the electrical to put in chargers um, that they're taking uh shifting loads from the building and and different types and from charger to charger to try to accommodate it without that additional cost and, um, and work. So I'm gonna have to um, curtail our conversation. I am so impressed by how much interest there is that the chat is just exploding. I, um, I think there's a lot of opportunity for more of these conversations. Um, lots of questions about geothermal. So maybe eco action, we could address that at some point um, in a separate um, presentation. Um, I would like to thank all of our speakers. This has been a very robust um, uh, session this evening. And thank you so much for your time and sharing your expertise with us. Um, were we in person, this is where everybody would clap for you. So consider yourselves <laughs> applauded. Um, sorry, we can't do that um, with the, the full sound effect, but um, everybody very much um, appreciates your efforts. Um, it has been great. Um, so we, we apologize for the technical issues um, early on in the show, um, things we cannot control, but everybody got a great grip on it. Good job. Um, and we'd like to thank everyone for attending this evening. It's been really, really interesting. Uh, I'm going to hand it back to Carrie uh, for a few final comments and we'll wrap it up. Thank you.
Thanks so much, Joan. Uh, I'd like to thank Joan for taking on the moderating job. It's it's never easy, and you did a great job. You brought your prior experience uh, uh, to your moderating, and I'd like to thank all the speakers as well, including Carl, who's off in Glasgow, um, ho hopefully making some important impact. I'd like to also acknowledge uh, members of Eco Action Arlington's advocacy team, some of whom, whom um, I'm sure are participating today for the work that they have done to uh, champion and pull together uh, these programs. Um, I'm gonna take a moment and I'm gonna share uh, the PowerPoint again, uh, just to um, call everyone's attention to some of our um, upcoming events. And I'm gonna do it in chronological order. Um, let's see, it's not sharing yet, is it? Um, present and does that is ever does everybody see the slide? Yeah, that's it. Starting in, in chronological order, and uh, the first is uh, one uh, that uh, the Faith Alliance uh, uh, group has coming up on November seventeenth, coming very soon. Their cl climate whoops crisis forum. Uh, if you want to uh, to see more details on it, uh, check out their website. There, uh, the link has more information. Um, and here are some upcoming eco action events. Uh, the first one, of course, uh, is a shared uh, co-sponsored event between Sierra Club and FAXA. January 6th is our next one, um, creating a pathway to zero carbon buildings. We'll be talking about not just our homes, but the larger commercial buildings uh, uh, in Arlington. It, that session will go into more detail on some of the legal, regulatory, and other challenges uh, to a real uh, rapid transformation in our building stock, which uh, really has to happen if we are going to work our way out of uh, the climate crisis uh, that Carl um, talked about in his opening presentation. Um, and then, of course, uh, January 11th, Volunteer Social, in, uh, uh, a warm invite to all EcoAction uh, Arlington's volunteers, and uh, January 17th, in honor of Martin Luther King Day uh, of service, uh, a cleanup activity. So a lot going on in January. So um, thank every. I'd like to thank everybody once again uh, for taking time out of your evening to participate with us. Um, your questions were terrific. The chat was terrific. And so I think we have all learned a lot and uh, have more questions that we want to uh, pursue answers to. Uh, to thank, so thanks to the speakers, thanks to Joan Kelsch again, and um, have a good night everyone uh, for the rest of your evening.